Hello and welcome to the OT Schoolhouse podcast, your source for the latest school-based occupational therapy tips, interviews, and research. Now, to get the conversation started, here are your hosts, Jason and Abby. Class is officially in session. Hello and welcome to the OT Schoolhouse podcast, episode number 15. And with us today, we have the birthday girl, Abby Piranha. Hello, everybody. I am 34 years old today. Do you like long walks on the beach? I do. (laughs) It just sounded like that's where you're going. Anyways, happy birthday, Abby. (laughs) I hope you're having a great day. Uh, Today is September 26th that we are recording this. And so uh, everyone, please leave Abby some love on the Facebook page and wish her a happy birthday, Uh, even if it is a few days late. I had, I also have to say, I have to give a shout out to my coworker, Gemma. She brought the most amazing cupcakes to work today and I got to pick first. So just bragging about my birthday. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Gemma is fantastic. Awesome. (laughs) So uh, real quick, hey, you want to tell them what we're doing in a few weeks? In a few weeks, we will be going to the Occupational Therapy Association of California conference in Pasadena. It is going to be a good time at per usual. Yeah. In fact, we're actually going to be presenting session number 75 on a Saturday afternoon. So if you're there, find us, say hi, or um, come by session number 75. I think it's at 2.30 on Saturday afternoon. So yeah, that's going to be fun. We're looking forward to talking about social media and the influence online media, all online media can have on school-based OT practitioners. So uh, swing on by. We would love to see you there. So let's jump into our interview today. Go ahead, Abby. Well, I had the opportunity to interview Robert Constantine. He is an occupational therapist with over 20 years of experience in the fields of visual and neurological rehab. He presently works for the Pearl Nelson Child Development Center, where he focuses on the treatment of eye movement disorders in neurotypical and special needs children. He is also a member of the Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Association, which brings together tools from optometry, occupational, and physical therapy. If you're looking for show notes, and a list of references, just head on over to episode 15, where you'll find all that information. And you can find those at otschoolhouse.com forward slash episode 15. And now let's jump into the interview. Thank you, Robert, for joining me tonight on the podcast. How did you get uh, into practicing vision rehab? So um, so I was working at a uh, local inpatient rehab here. I'm in Pensacola, Florida. I was working for West Florida Rehab, where I had been the uh, OT clinical specialist for TBI for about nine years. Um, I had taken uh, Mary Warren's vision course, which is uh, a very good course if you're looking for a course on that, ah. and had a big interest in vision. I started looking for a new adventure and found on Craigslist a, uh, an ad for an optometry practice that was looking for an occupational therapist. Really? So their, uh, yeah. So their idea was um, they were going to offer low vision services at the optometry office. Um, I would be doing teaching eccentric viewing. Um, Dr. Katie Spear and Carl, Carl Spear were the owners of that practice at Sight and Sun Eye Works here in Pensacola. And we were going to be doing. I would be teaching eccentric viewing, teaching patients to do uh, um, to use assistive devices going out doing some um, home modifications and those sort of things. Um, So what actually happened was um, I started getting those TBI patients that were having eye movement problems. I started getting stroke patients with visual field cuts. I started, uh, one of our doctors, um, Dr. Charles Porch, who was with us at the time, was sending me a lot of kids that were having near vision focusing problems and eye movement problems that was, uh, was affecting their academic performance. Yes. So I had to scramble about to figure out how to, um, to do this job. And uh, as if you've looked around for resources on this, they're kind of hard to find. So I learned a whole bunch real quick, um, not real quick, about seven or eight months. And um, it has been, uh, it's been an amazing journey. Um, I also got to um, do some sports vision training when I was there. Um, with, uh, with Dr. Don T, who's one of sort of the founding fathers of performance vision training. So we got to do cool stuff with that. Um, worked with some NHRA drag racers, uh, my brother and wow. his buddies, we developed some glasses for that. Um, 
And it was really, it's been an amazing adventure. Uh, a member of the Neurooptometric Rehab Association, I did their uh, clinical level one and level two training to, uh, to learn about um, better ways to treat those um, uh, visual and vision related problems uh, with stroke and TBI. So it's been a great adventure. It, it sounds crazy, but it's amazing what kids can do when they can see. And um, that's why it, it's really become a passion for me, teaching other therapists, making other therapists aware of this, that this this such a basic thing, like they can't see the words in front of them, um, how, uh, how often we just sort of take that for granted a bit. You know, and that is a very good point. And that's why I really was super excited to have you come on the podcast because I personally have seen this in my own practice and in working with schools, just noticing that students oftentimes in OT were assessing students in school-based practice, but we're not quite sure of or quite getting the whole picture when we don't have that vision piece. And that was Mm -hmm. just an area that I know I personally have always kind of thought, "Mm, this kid is doing something and I can't quite put my finger on what is happening here. So, and I think it's vision related, but I'm not positive. So that was just, I was very glad that you were coming um, on the podcast. And so I guess, why do you feel that occupational therapists are well suited to provide interventions in this area? Like how do we tie it back to the functional skills of occupational therapy? So when, when I first started working um, at the eye doctor's office, I was around doctors all the time. I was around optometrists. I was around um, vision therapy doctors. I was around sports vision doctors. I was around brilliant optometrists, and I was very intimidated by that. But what I found out was, was those doctors are really good at vision. Mm-hmm. But they don't have that background in kinesiology. They don't have that background in activity analysis where we can look at something and go, how do we incorporate that? They don't get those courses in developmental spectrum and sequence. Mm -hmm. So um, they were very interested in how I took what I learned from them and and put that together with OT. That background for us is, um, is, 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 is makes us a little more effective or at least as effective as what they're doing in vision therapy. Um, the other thing that tends to happen, and what I tell folks as I teach them, so we, we already, we get a kiddo who's having problems with visual motor integration, and we're going to look at his posture, and we're going to look at his scapula, and we're going to look at how he's holding the pencil, right. and we're going to do things to improve those things. But we're kind of leaving out the visual part of visual motor integration. Yes. And I kind of think of it as sort of a three-step process where we first have to see and get accurate stimuli in. We can then take and manipulate, process that visual stimulus, and then we can act and produce a result on that. And we tend to focus much more quickly on the output part, on Mm -hmm. what is their, you know, what is their grip, their posture, those things. Or we tend to go to, while it looks like he's having a processing thing, when um, a lot of times we find out, hey, he just can't see the thing you want him to copy. Right. And um, so what I tell them is they, they draw wonky squares because they're seeing wonky squares. Yes. Oh, that's exactly it. So I guess some of the assessments, like when I'm looking at a child in their classroom performance, some of the assessments we use, like the Beery VMI or Mm -hmm. the RAVMA, the Wide Range Assessment of Visual Motor Abilities, or even the BOT, um, Mm -hmm. I do pick up on. So what are some of, in those assessments, when we're looking at students, um, as you say, drawing wonky shapes <laughs> because they're possibly <laughs> seeing wonky shapes. Um, right. How can we better tease out or understand the vision part of visual motor integration or, for instance, the bot with the tennis ball, the, that mm-hmm. subtest or the fine precision Fine motor integrate. Actually, all of mm-hmm. those subtests require vision. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, all of and right, all of these things require and assume that you have best corrected visual acuity, right. and that your eyes are moving well together. Um, things you can look for before you even start the assessment. Yes. So, is this kiddo rubbing their eyes? Are mm-hmm. they blinking a whole lot? There, those are signs that this this child is potentially having a um, 
have an, an accommodative problem. They're having a problem with accommodation in their eyes. Um, what did the teacher say? Hey, he's skipping lines when he's reading. He's reading words backwards. Mm-hmm. Or he reads the first half of the sentence pretty good, and then the second half, he sort of gets really creative what's going on there. And what happens is, so their eyes stay focused for that first half of the sentence, they become fatigued and get blurry. So our buddy attempts to make up or guess what that the rest of that sentence is going on there. Oh, wow. Um, you're going to see things like head turns. I'm going to try this eye and see if I can see out of this one. I'm going to try that eye and mm-hmm. see if I can see out of that one. Um, maybe those kiddos that prop their head up and they cover up one eye when they're reading. Yes. Okay. So their brain is figured out, hey, I have a binocular vision problem. Here's the solution to that. I'm going to read without binocular vision and I'm going to cover one eye. So those sort of behavioral things are very common. That inability to catch a ball. So as a, as a ball comes mm-hmm. toward us, our two eyes lock on that ball and your brain gets um, cues from proprioception as your eyes converge as the ball comes closer and the visual flow on that ball and they tell you to lift your hands up and catch the ball. Right. So we know how our kids catch. Our kids hold their hands up and they turn away from the ball because they've been hit in the face with the ball a whole lot. Yes. So they're hoping you aim for their hands and this becomes sort of a reaction time test. How quick can I close my hands and catch the ball? Because their eyes aren't teeming well, their brain doesn't get that cue about now it's time to to reach up and catch the ball. Um, Those things are very common. Um, Those unexplained headaches. Uh, mm. kids who have, um, kids who kind of look like they have ADHD, yes. but when you give them ADHD medication, it doesn't help. Okay. And ADHD looks a little mild, but, um, so, so those are all the things. And, and this is such a predictable pattern as okay. uh, behaviorally, as you see this, um, I, I was reading things. Uh, As I read things on the internet, I hear, you know, oh, I have this kiddo who's Mm -hmm. been diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD, but his medication isn't working. So immediately that sends up a red flag for me. Hey, what's his eyes look like? Can he see up close? So those are going to be the common things you're going to find um, with kids that are having these sort of near vision focusing problems. Okay. That is very helpful because that, and you do have on your website, otrobert.wordpress.com. Um, dot com mm-hmm. that I loved the resource you have of it's a PDF of those things to look for. I think I read right. it's like a checklist. It's the mm-hmm. is that the behavioral. convergence insufficiency yes, the symptom convergence, survey? Yep. Okay. And I thought that that was a pretty good kind of reference tool for convergence insufficiency, which brings me to because I'm not a vision specialist. Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned binocular vision, convergence insufficiency. What are some other, uh, would you mind defining those terms sure. and maybe some other terms that, you know, we might be uh-huh. needing to know so, as OTs? So when you head to the eye doctor's office, um, the doctor plays a little better or worse game. Is it A or B or one or mm-hmm. two? And all optometry jokes are based on um, one or two, A or B. They're hilarious. <laughs> so... Um, So they're all based on that. So that's called a refraction. And what that refraction is doing is just adjusting for the fact that your eye is is most likely not perfectly spherical like a golf ball. So you get glasses or you get contacts that helps to redirect the the path, the image in so it falls directly on your fovea and you see nice and clear. Um, What those glasses don't influence are, are those two eyes coordinated and working well together? Okay. Um, are the muscles in the eyes, are they nice and balanced? Are they both equally strong and up to the task for what they're doing? So these eye movements are controlled by muscles and they, they um, behave like most other muscles. Mm-hmm. They fatigue. They can be imbalanced. Um, so what happens with um, – well, let's talk about convergence insufficiency yeah. because that's going to be the thing that's going to be the most common. Uh, depending on the study you look at, about 8% of kiddos, um, neurotypical kids, are walking around with convergence insufficiency, wow, with an eye movement high. problem. That's a lot, a lot of kids. That is. That's a, bunch that's of a kiddos. lot of kids. Um, so 
convergence and sufficiency is a problem with the near vision focusing system. So what's supposed to happen as we see up close, our eyes should converge. They should move in towards the nose, nice and strong. They should stay there. Um, at the same time, we have a lens in each eye. That lens is attached to muscles. Um, the peripheral of that lens is attached to muscles in the eye. That muscle contracts and allows for that lens to focus. That part of the near vision system is called accommodation. Okay. Um, very closely tied to that accommodation is going to be pupillary constriction. Mm -hmm. So as that child, as, their, um, as that lens is accommodating, we're going to see their pupil constrict as well. So as you bring something closer, you should see their pupils get nice and small as well as their eyes move towards their nose. With convergence insufficiency, there tends to be a lack of coordination or a muscle imbalance, particularly where the medial rectus muscles, the one mm -hmm. closest to the nose, are um, too weak to overcome the lateral ones as they come in. So what you see as you assess this as you bring a target towards a child's nose, rather than following that target all the way to their nose, um, you're going to see their eyes kind of, they're going to separate and one eye is not going to follow that in. Okay. And that's going to let you know, hey, this kiddo, that's one of the um, diagnostic criteria. That's called near point of convergence as we assess mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, I'll describe it, but um, it's better if you see it. And you can go to my blog. There's a video on how to do this. You're going to mm -hmm. start with a target about 24 or 30 inches away, and you tell your kiddo, tell me if you see two. And you're going to bring this target towards their nose and watch their eyes. Mm -hmm. And you want to see their eyes come all the way in right until you get to their nose and they stay there. And you're going to do this five times. You're going to do five trials with this. Okay. So um, normal is going to be within six centimeters after those five trials. And that's going to tell you, hey, this kiddo has a good, strong um, convergence system. The convergence is working well. And generally, um, one or the other doesn't go bad. If convergence is bad, the accommodation is bad and vice versa. Okay. So, but this is the quickest way to find those, um, to find those kids that are having near vision focusing problems. Okay. Um, and so this is going to impact in the classroom um, this is going to impact their copying ability, Absolutely. their attention, their reading, yes. and all of those so, skills. So while those eyes are sort of weak up close, as they go out to the board, their eyes are going to diverge and mm -hmm. then come back in again and then diverge and then converge and diverge and converge. So this becomes really calisthenics mm. calisthenics for those eye muscles. This becomes a very aggressive um, eye exercise. And okay. when it started off, when our buddy couldn't see up close, within going to that board and back three or four times, he can't see the board or up close because his eyes are so fatigued. He's, he's seeing double in both places. Generally, the kids don't know that they're not supposed to see that way. Oh, okay. So they won't tell you they won't tell you the words are moving around on the page or I see double up close. They might mention I, I'm having trouble seeing the board. And then mm -hmm. they go down to the to the hall and they they read the chart and the the school nurse goes, he read the chart, he was fine. And okay. he was. Most of the kids who come to see me are 2020. Okay, yeah. That was my next um mm -hmm. question because when I was reading on your website, which has a ton of amazing information, <laughs> I was up late reading through it because it, I just, my brain kept going. Um, mm -hmm. I read that only about 40% of children have their eyes actually examined by an eye doctor and that possibly even with 2020 vision, their eye exam may not include things like this. Is that Absolutely. correct? So, um, so that 2020 means that that image falls perfectly on your phobia and you see, um, you see clearly without any blur. Okay. It does not talk about any of those dynamic processes that we talked about as we're seeing near vision, as we're doing saccades across the paper. So that 2020 means, yes, the, that static error has been corrected for, but it doesn't affect the movement of the eyes at all. 2020, right. as the, the, the eye doctors tell you, 2020 is not enough. Right. And for so, our kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about saccades, would you mind just kind of elaborating a little bit on saccades and reading and how all of that kind of works? Right. So a saccade is going to be a very small, very fast movement. Mm -hmm. um, so this was uh, saccades originally sort of developed evolutionarily so we could 
we could, uh, they respond to changes in the peripheral. As we were out hiking, um, um, hunting in the woods, if there was a bear off to the side of the trail, the bear would move and our eyes would very quickly pop over there and go, hey, look out, there's a bear. Yeah. <laughs> so as we, um, as we evolved and we started to read, these very short, fast movements are now how we go about um, reading. So it's going to be a series of uh, fixations and saccades that allow us to read accurately. Um, so it becomes a coordination thing. Ah. So are those two eyes coordinating correctly? Um, it's, uh, it, it's pretty easy to improve those with some, with some basic exercises and things. But um, saccades are very important. Saccades are also how we define visual space. Right. So okay. um, as, you, as you walk into a room, your with your nice still head, your eyes very quickly pop around the room and you set up a nice spatial map of the room where you can close your eyes and find things in the room. Mm -hmm. Our kiddos with inaccurate saccades, with excessive head movement during those saccades, don't get an accurate spatial map. <gasps> so what happens is we send them to find their shoes after our treatment session mm -hmm. and they tell you, I can't find my shoes. So this is another thing. Those saccades are very important about defining those um, that that spatial sort of defining the size of the universe. Right. And that, you know, that makes a whole lot of sense um, because, well, it I when I've been working in OT, when you have the kids that are very inattentive and then in the classroom, you they kind of almost seem really unaware of things in their mm -hmm. environment. They run into right. kids. They have no concept really of their body position in relation to other objects in the room. Would mm -hmm. those be sort of behaviors? I know there's sensory processing involved with that, but also this seems like it would play a big role too. Um, yeah, I see where a lot of times the kids with eye movement problems um, in general tend to be a little clumsy. And part of that is there is a lack of awareness of you know, if I if I close my eyes, I know I have stuff over to my right. If I fall to my right, I'm going to trip over things. Mm -hmm. That lack of that spatial map can affect that. Um, but they they also because those eyes don't work well, um, so they're, they they should focus on the edge of a step as they're walking towards the step, and and again on that convergence should send a signal that says now it's time to step up over the step. Mm -hmm. When their eyes don't work well together, they don't get that signal for now it's time to step over the step. So they trip over the edge of the step. So all of those movements are affecting those functional things. But right, they're not getting a good spatial map. So they don't know where their buddy is. So they bump into him or they can't find their book bag or they trip over a desk or whatever. Right. Oh, th that just I had not <laughs> even thought of it that way because I think and I think the way or why these are just such light bulb moments for me is because we give assessments such as the sensory processing measure for mm -hmm. the sensory profile and they and we do that kind of assuming again that these skills are all intact and that when we're looking at the behaviors related to sensory processing we're not really or at least when I've done it I've not considered these other deficit area or possible areas of need well, it, it's crazy. We we get kids in our practice who have had early intervention, PT, OT, speech, neuropsych mm -hmm. evaluations, ABA, all of these services. And so we just sort of assume, well, of course he can see. At some point, someone took him to the eye doctor. Right. Someone, he's wearing glasses, so that means his vision is good. So we tend to to just sort of take it for granted, and and I I love the light bulb moments as I um, <laughs> as I present my course around. I'll, I'll I, I talk and I, I look out over the folks, and you'll see I'll say something, and you can almost see that little light bulb go off on top of their head. They're like, "Oh, that's why that kiddo is doing that." So mm -hmm. it's um, it it's it's really cool to do that, but it's we just sort of take it for granted. We get 75% yeah. of our information about the universe around us from vision. Right. And we're not even asking, hey, have you had an eye exam? And mm -hmm. so that's, um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to step up on that as therapists. But um, we yes. need to be able, the, the next part of that is, is we need to have optometrists behind us. We need to have eye doctors behind us who are going to do that complete eye exam. 
who are going to make sure that these things are appropriately assessed. And sometimes that's not always easy to find. Right. And I guess that was kind of um, one of my questions, and I'm not sure if you can answer it, but how can us Mm -hmm. as school-based OTs kind of refer kids for those more comprehensive Uh, exams? So the magic words are a binocular vision exam. Okay, that was what my question is. That's the magic words. The magic words are binocular vision exam. I know a lot of times with the school-based OTs, you can't say your child needs a binocular vision exam or an eye exam because then the school system becomes financially uh, burdened with that, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So um, what I have is a, a sheet of reading tips. And it's things like, so your hey, your kiddo, is your child having trouble reading? Is he holding the reading material at 20 centimeters away? Is ah. he reading in a well-lit area? Um, is he sitting upright and showing good posture while he's reading? Has he had a binocular vision assessment? Eye movements can affect reading performance. So this becomes a way where it's not, um, it's, it's more a, a tip sheet for reading. And it doesn't say take okay. your child to a binocular vision exam. But it does give some folks some words to use that um, they can Google and find those folks out. Um, the, the most reliable source, the COVD doctors, the doctors who are doing vision therapy. Okay. Um, they have had special training to uh, – so all, all optometrists and ophthalmologists know how to do a binocular vision exam. Okay. It is the standard of care for a uh, pediatric eye exam for both of those professions okay. to do a binocular vision exam, a, um, a, a, a psychoplegic dilation, which is a specialized dilation, and, um, and, and to, to refract using a technique called retinoscopy as okay. opposed to better or worse. They use this very objective way of doing that with our kids. So they all know how to do this. They all know this is the, this is a thing. Mm-hmm. They all learned it in school. They all learned how they all had to do it in order to pass their boards. Okay. So they will know that this is a thing. Now, whether they feel comfortable doing it or not is going to be something else. Oh, okay. Um, so some of the optometrists kind of like if I had to treat an extensor tendon repair. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. So I would be like, oh, I remember those words being together. Yeah. But yeah, I don't really want to treat an extensor tendon repair. Right. So there's going to be some doctors that are more comfortable with it than others. Okay. The vision therapy doctors, the COVD doctors, and COVD is the College of Optometrists and Visual Development. These are the mm-hmm. doctors that offer vision therapy. Okay. They're going to be the most reliable source, but a lot of times these doctors are cash only. And uh, so that's going to limit access. Right. Um, there's also a lot of communities, even here in Pensacola where I'm at, we don't have a COVD doctor. Mm. And there's a lot of communities that don't have access to a, a VT doctor at all. Yeah. Um, what I will tell um, the therapists is, so the optometrists, they want to work with us because we have all the kids that have the eye movement problems and need glasses. So um, the opportunities there to talk with some docs and go, hey, I, I need someone to do this. I need right. someone that can reliably do this. And um, you may have to call up and, uh, and kiss a couple of frogs before you find <laughs> the prince. But I think um, in those in those rural communities, in those communities that don't have a vision therapy doctor, you're going to find a doc who is interested in doing this, who wants to do this assessment. I, I think sometimes they don't do it because they don't have a way to treat it if they're not oh, doing vision I therapy. See. Mm-hmm. So, um, so a lot of times in the community as well, um, as I go around and teach, someone knows who um, who the good doc is. And a lot of times in my class, someone will say, oh, you got to send them to this to this person over here. They right. do a great job. They're they're pretty reliable. They take all the uh, the the insurances and that sort of thing. OK, that makes a lot of sense. And it's important, yeah. it seems, to get these kind of vision issues diagnosed so then we can come up with better accommodations and strategies for the classroom, which leads me to my kind of next question. Um mm-hmm. When we're talking about, I often get parents and teachers and <clears throat> psychologists and just staff in general mentioning dyslexia. And how does that differ from 
what you're talking about with the movement of the eyes. What and it's so, my understanding it has to do with auditory processing a bit as it has, well. It has a it's a phonological problem. So um, I work okay. a lot. I, I talk a lot with the folks at the Read Write Learning Center, mm -hmm. um, and they have offices in Daphne, Alabama, in Montgomery, Alabama, and Mobile, Alabama. But they also can do dyslexia assessment and treatment over Skype. Oh, okay. So um, if you do not have, and I haven't been to any city yet in America where they say we have great dyslexia resources here and you can get an assessment. Here's the people you go to. Okay. So um, readwritelearningcenter.com, they can help you out with that. Thank so you. all of the kids who come to see me are typically um, have the signs of that you typically think of as dyslexia. They have letter reversals. Mm -hmm. They may be flipping whole words, was become saw. They're generally not very good readers. Okay. So over the six years I've worked um, with the with these kiddos, after we've cleaned up their eye movements, I've had I've have had fourteen children who have tested positive for dyslexia. So what happens with dyslexia is it's a it's a problem of encoding and decoding phonetics. Okay. And I'll tell you some of the things that I see with um, in, in those kids. As you have them write the alphabet, they consistently leave out the same letters. Oh, and okay. And I had two. I had two kiddos that left out the whole middle of the alphabet from J to Q. Ah. Um, one of them was in fifth grade, and I cued him after writing the uppercase alphabet. Hey, hey, my my dude, you left out the whole middle of the alphabet, <laughs> right. and he did the same yeah. thing. So you see that very hard time learning the letters. I had another young lady that was five, and she was very closely watching my mouth as I was saying the letters, oh. B, C, D, V, trying to figure out what letter I, I was saying. I see. So um, you're going to see that. You're going to see kids with dyslexia. They're going to have a hard time phonetically spelling words. Okay. So their their command of how phonetics works is is not very good. So if you tell them, hey, take a guess at how you spell that, a lot of times their go to strategy is I stick an e on the end of the word. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they they don't have good good enough command of those phonetics in order to be able to do that. So this is a highly specialized area. There's 150 different types of dyslexia. It wow. is. Um, it's fascinating. It is. Like I said, those fourteen other kids that I saw had binocular vision problems, and they had dyslexia underneath that. Okay, so you can when have both. We absolutely. When we cleaned up the binocular vision problems, what we saw was, um, I had one young lady who actually became a very proficient reader. She was reading above her age, uh, uh, her grade level. Wow. But she couldn't. She couldn't spell her words. She could orally spell them. She mm -hmm. could verbally take her spelling test and do fine. Yes. When it came time to translate that sound into symbols, that's when she had the problem and she would fail her spelling tests. Okay. So there we're looking at that encoding mm -hmm. of sounds or decoding of sounds is the word, is the reading part of that. And those are going to be more typical of the, um, of, of children with dyslexia. Okay. Again, though, they can have both of these. And, and right. um, Hunter Oswald, the director of the Read Write Learning Center, recently sent me a child over who said, you know, I don't think this kiddo has has dyslexia. I think he's got that eye movement thing that you do. So we're <laughs> finishing up with him. And it's really interesting. His sister had the same thing. He's 12. Um, and his sister as well had convergence problems. Oh, wow. So I've had yeah. I've had now 15 or 16 sets of siblings. So oh, I won't say this runs in the family, right? But it certainly tends to cluster up. I went, I went uh, two out of three on um, on one of uh, one of the OT's kids here. Two of her three kids have. So it it'll tend to sort of run in the family a little bit. I see. But um, dyslexia as well is going to have a genetic component to it as well. Okay. So, um, so those are going to be the things you're looking for is it, it tends to look like a visual problem. Mm -hmm. And again, I was able to take them to a certain point with reading, right? but, um, it's going to come back to that difficulty encoding and decoding those phonetics, those sounds. Okay. That, 
helps me tremendously because that was that's kind of one of those areas where you think you know what it is or what it looks mm-hmm. like, but you're only really, you know, as OTs, we look a lot at the writing and and sometimes I think we're missing certain components or if the child's not making progress, it's good to kind of just kind yeah. of look at what it is the actual deficit areas are or the areas of need mm-hmm. for the child. Um, which, so when you're working with children, um, oftentimes in school-based practice, we're not given the same level of, um, we don't give the same level of services and supports for the children as one would in a medical setting. Um, so with these types of difficulties, I guess, how often do you see the kids in the clinic and how, what's the duration of sessions and sort of how do you Mm -hmm. monitor or measure progress for these kids? So for me, all of my kids are coming with a vision problem. Um, Two thirds of them, it is a diagnosed vision problem. Okay. So you already know. So so I already know that they're coming with that. Um, That said, I see my kids twice a week for an hour. Okay. Um, The convergence insufficiency treatment trial, which gave us the the symptom survey we talked about earlier, Mm -hmm. in that trial, they used a protocol um, that consisted of 12 visits. Okay. And that would that that protocol was seventy five percent effective. Wow. Um, I tend to see kids, uh, neurotypical kids. I can generally correct their convergence and near vision eye movement problems in eight to ten visits. Wow, that's not so the, too long. No, it it comes along um, very quickly. Okay. Uh, so what I found is, if I I can do those eight to ten visits twice a week. Mm-hmm. Or I can do those eight to 10 visits once a week, and it still takes eight to 10 visits. Okay. So unlike looking um, for that elbow, because again, what we're going to be doing is exercises that are just going to strengthen muscles. That's mm-hmm. all of this that's happening here. So as we, um, as we stop and think about an elbow that's weak, we do have to stop and we have to grab some TheraBand and do some exercises to strengthen that elbow. Um, our eyes, as we strengthen those muscles... They're up there all the time attempting to figure out the best possible strategy. As we strengthen those muscles, the eyes are going to practice those strategies as best they can. Mm -hmm. So I tend not to, you know, um, if I get from from zero to four on this visit, when I come back for the next visit, we don't start at zero again. We start at four and we go from four to eight. And then on the next visit, we might go from six to ten. So we tend to jump and make hops very, very quickly. Okay. Um, so even in, if you're just getting a half an hour a week, um, even making simple modifications, we, we love midline crossing tasks. Right. So what if we take midline crossing tasks and we turn them near far and we put them in the Z axis and now rather than a midline crossing task, we're now working near far. We're now okay. working that near far near vision system. Mm-hmm. Um, but even in those half hour sessions you guys are getting once a week, within three or four sessions, you're going to see some improvement there. Okay. Um, make sure you're holding their, their little head still. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a big one. I, I used to get a lot of questions <laughs> on that. So what we're supposed to see with the with the still head is by, by 10 years old, we should see a still head. That decline should start to happen. Um, beginning at five years old. Okay. So some that that head movement is going to decrease until ten years old, and then we shouldn't see that anymore as we're assessing eye movements. Our kids, our ten year olds, all have excessive head movements. That's okay. because there are ten year olds. Mm. They've been referred because that that head movement separation is very much tied to vestibular development. Yes. It's tied to proprioceptive development. It's tied to overall brain development. So when we're getting referred to a kiddo who's having trouble with body awareness, who's having um, trouble with balance, yes. those other systems are not developed. We're going to find the ocular motor system is not developed along with that. And you may pick that up as, as rough cicades, as mm-hmm. lousy tracking. And you're going to see that with excessive head movement because all those systems rely upon one, one another in order to get stronger as they develop. Right. And that sort of leads me right into my next um, kind of set of questions, I guess, or next topic Uh area um, would be, I work Mm -hmm. in a program, uh, one of the programs I provide support for has a many children with autism. Um, Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we're looking at sensory processing 
difficulties with that population um, related to self-regulation, but also what I notice is it's kind of what came first, the chicken or the egg kind of situation where they're having trouble with self-regulation, but they're also not processing things in their environment. Um, Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of seeking movement, vestibular, proprioceptive movement. And then I often have found as well the coordination of their body movements in relation to what they're seeing in the environment or their response to stimuli in the environment can be clumsy. So Mm -hmm. what is your background? I I guess, how does vision and autism, how do these skills go together? There has been, I I just recently updated my, um, my presentation concerning autism uh, because Mm -hmm. there's been several studies late 2017, early 2018 that are showing um, showing some interesting things. Yeah. So so the first thing with our kids with autism is they're going to have a higher rate of accommodative problems. They're going to have more trouble seeing up close mm-hmm. than um, than the neurotypical population. Ah. So what that means is that eye exam for them is going to be very important. Okay. So it, it's um, sort of worst case scenario for the parents because they need that psychoplegic dilation, which is going to help assess that near vision system better. Okay. Um, and so the parents know, you know, my, my kiddo is going to have a meltdown when we try to do this, but they have a higher rate of problems seeing uh. up close. And so now we think about handwriting, we think about those visual motor integrations problems, those fine motor deficits yes. buttoning and those sort of things. Right. So those sort of things there, um, this sort of gazing at things in the peripheral. Yes. Okay. So that is another way of squinting. Oh. Okay. That's another way of attempting to squint. It is also, they're, they're shown. So let's see. So we actually have two visual systems. We have, we have two things happening in our brain with vision. We mm. have this central, the, the central visual field. And then we have our peripheral visual field. Okay. So that peripheral visual field is called the magnocellular tract. And it's, it's very much involved in balance. It's involved in gait. Um, the easiest way to describe this magnocellular tract. So if you're taking a hike in the woods and the trail goes uphill, mm-hmm. your magnocellular tract sees the, the, the tilt of the trail change. And it automatically adjusts your posture and gait so you can continue to walk up the hill. Okay. Okay. So what we're finding in kids with autism is a decreased integration of connections between the cerebellum and this magnocellular tract. Okay. And so they are thinking this could be part of why we see things. First, those fine motor problems. Mm-hmm. Why we're seeing problems with increased toe walking in children yes. with um, with autism as well. Uh, another study, um, and I think uh, we're going to have the, the that list of resources is yes. going to be up on your website. Yep. So all of these Thank articles you. are out there, and I, I encourage you to go read them up because they're they're absolutely fascinating. If you want to be an eyeball nerd, you got to go to the source. So mm-hmm. go read the resources. Um, so some of the uh, so they're they're finding this lack of integration between those two pathways. Okay. What they found was the the children with autism did not make that postural shift in response to a visual change. Okay. So when their brain sees the trail go uphill, it does not adjust their gait to help them right. walk up that hill without difficulty. So pretty consistently, this this was coming back to a lack of connections into and out of the cerebellum and a, and a lack of integration between the cerebellum and this magnocellular postural tract. Couple that with difficulty seeing up close with a mm-hmm. higher rate of seeing up close. And suddenly maybe some of these gazes off to the side, this toe walking. Um, one of the other things that was suggested was our kids with autism have a very narrow attentional visual field. Okay. Um, so this isn't, it doesn't mean they have poor peripheral vision. It means rather than seeing a whole forest, they only see a tree at a time. Okay. And so they were suggesting that this small uh, central attentional field, um, they were having difficulty getting all the sensory input into there. As they're looking at your face and you're giving instructions and your mouth is moving they're attempting to process that auditory information, it becomes overwhelming. 
So they look away and they lose eye contact. Okay. So um, there were some things that were tried with that. And um, sometimes it's effective and sometimes it's not. But you may see some of those, some of that um, eye, uh, eye contact behavior as well. You may mm-hmm. find that some of the eye doctors are trying some things to help with that as well. So it sounds like so, it's... Oh, sorry to interrupt. It just sounds like uh-huh. it's a somewhat of a newer uh, research area. Like this is kind of an emerging area of research as far as the children with autism, that population. Mm-hmm. Well, what happened was um, as, as we lost Asperger's, we lost pervasive developmental disorder, and mm-hmm. all of that became ASD, we now had a much broader population to look at. Okay. And um, several of the studies that I read talked about how earlier studies showed things differently. Um, o- studies on ocular motor problems in, in kids with autism, half of them say yes, they have a higher rate of ocular motor problems, and the other half say no, they have a, a, a regular rate of ocular motor problems. Okay. That just means we need to check that out as well. But because right. of this redefinition of autism, we're finding some different data and they're finding some different trends as well. Okay. That, I mean, that's certainly an area that I'm very interested in Mm -hmm. as well. Um, So I know we've touched on so many topics and I am very grateful (laughs) for this podcast um, opportunity to speak with you. I I just know right now my wheels are turning in my head of different ways that I'm going to be able to help my students. Um, and so I know I will probably be visiting your site more often, but also I know that you offer continuing education courses through, um, PESI, is that right? P-E-S-I? So, um, so what's happening right now is, Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the month, I'm going to be in Northern California. I'm going to be starting in Reno and I'll be in Sacramento, San Jose, Walnut Creek. Um, Uh. I skipped somewhere. Anyway, I'll be in Northern (laughs) California at the end of the month, starting on September 24th. That course is through Vine, um, Vine. Mm V-Y-N-E. The course is called Vision Vision Rehabilitation for Pediatrics, Okay. Seeing the Whole Picture. So you can go over to Vine's website, and they have uh, where you can get registered to see those. There's also a digital seminar where you can go in and watch that as a webinar. Um, Oh, very good. So that's there. So that's my last tour with the Vine name. So PESI is a is a larger um, continuing education provider, okay. and they bought Vine. So what's happening is my course is changing names, and it's mm-hmm. changing sponsors, but the course um, material-wise is going to be the same thing. So you can go to PESI.com, okay. and the new title of the course is called Assessing and treating the visual system in children and adolescents, and adolescents. So it's kind of a longer name. Um, you can actually go to pesi p e s i dot com and just search for my last name if you want, Constantine C O N S T A N T I N E. And um, by searching for my name, it's going to pull up those courses. So I'm going to be in uh, in Wichita, in Overland Park, Kansas, in St. Louis in October. Oh. And then in November, I'm going back out west to Phoenix, Albuquerque, Colorado Springs, Denver, and Fort Collins. Um, so I will be uh, spending a lot of time out west in the next couple months, and I am looking forward to that. I, uh, um, I've been all over the place. It's interesting. Yeah. Therapists are all the same. It doesn't <laughs> matter if it's in if it's in Manhattan, if it's in um, Grand Rapids, if it's in uh, Iowa. We're all sort of the same. Um, interestingly quirky sort of folks. Isn't that the and, truth? <laughs> uh, it is. We're, we're all, yeah, we're, we're all the same sort of folks. We're all griped about the same. Uh, we're all uh, irritated about the same thing. Um, <laughs> that's um, true. One more thing on the course on November 21st. That's a mm-hmm. Monday. Yeah. That course is going to be done live. Oh, so that was if my you're, uh, If you're hanging out at the house on November, I'm sorry, November 12th. So if November you're hanging 12th. out at the house on a Monday, November the 12th, mm-hmm. and uh, you can watch this live. And um, we'll go into um, how to assess for eye movement problems, uh, standardized testing, all of those sort of things, the research that supports everything that I do. And then uh, in the afternoon, we talk about treatment and I show you some videos of, uh, of what I do in the clinic. That's fantastic because I know that I can't get up to Northern California by the end of the month because I'm in Southern California. So I'm super bummed that you're not going to be in Southern California at the end of the month. But if you ever are, I will be signing up for your class. 
I was there. I was in San Diego, uh, L.A. area, I guess, three tours ago. Ah. And um, and, and uh, so part of what we're hoping for with the change to PESI, PESI is a mighty marketing machine. Ah. So um, hopefully uh, if I end up back in Southern California, you're going to get – emails and things in your mailbox and all kind of stuff to make sure uh, everybody knows I'm there. Um, yes. You can always go to, uh, I have a Facebook group as well. It's called Vision Rehab OT. I'm a member. And you can always <laughs> go to Vision Rehab OT and I post where I'm going next. I post uh, cheesy eyeball jokes mm-hmm. um, and all sort of vision related things. And you never know, uh, 2019, um, I'm going to, I'm waiting on where I'm going in, uh, February and March in 2019. I haven't heard back yet. Could be doing an adult course. Um, oh, if, uh, if you're doing some things, so yeah. that could be happening in 2019. Well, so, sounds like you're a busy man. <laughs> I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to record this podcast. And I know I personally have found a lot of your videos very interesting Mm -hmm. and a lot of good tools um, and tricks that we can be trying to practice and help these kids out. Um, And I just now I know kind of a couple of the key phrases to throw out there. Um, The binocular Mm -hmm. vision exam was just. It's one of those things where that's a very specific <laughs> phrase that I know will, uh, I'm sure if a parent takes that to an optometrist or uh, eye doctor, they're going to get something out of that. Hopefully so. they're going to get the thing that they need to get. Yes. And that's um, and the key. Like I said, they, they are aware that this is the, um, the standard of care. And to some extent, it's done, it's done one way or the other. But um, it, it needs to be uh, the doctor I work with here in Pensacola, um, mm-hmm. Dr. Mark Obenchain, OBS. <laughs> OBS uh, does this complete eye exam on every person under 18 years old. And okay. so he will frequently find problems that have been overlooked for years. I had a, right. I had a level one OT student who came in and saw me. And as I was explaining how we assess this, I said, uh, so do you get headaches at night? Yeah, I get migraines sometimes. Yeah, she had convergence insufficiency. Ah. Um, 24 <laughs> years old, working on her master's in OT, doing her level one. Wow. So um, it's out there. It's all over the place. Looks like she was, it must have been a divine <laughs> intervention that her level one field work was with you. <laughs> yeah, it happens a lot. It happens a lot where the wow. folks who come to my class go, you know what? I think I have this. Yeah, it looks like you do. So oh. it happens. Well, I know I will be... Um, Looking at things, no pun intended, quite oh, Puns are great. We all love puns. <laughs> That's true. Anyone who's been to my class knows that I am the punniest guy around. Well, I, I, love it. I can tell you it has been a real pleasure um, talking to you about this. So thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we can talk about it again at some point, maybe even get even more in depth. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm always here to help. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Special thank you to Robert Constantine for the interview. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the OT Schoolhouse podcast. For more ways to help you and your students succeed right now, head on over to OTSchoolhouse.com. Until next time, class is dismissed.